have uh, Sir Andrew Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Trop Tropical Medicine. And it's a privilege and honor to have him here today to deliver this talk. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction to Sir Andrew and, and we'll then follow with his talk and we'll have a short 10 minute you know, Q&A, question answers from the audience. Uh, so Andrew Ames was the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for nearly 10 years until October 2010. Uh, he continues to work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as a professor of environmental change in public health, joint appointment in the Department of Public Health, environmental society and department of population health. He was previously professor of primary health care and director of the Department of Primary Care and Population Sciences at UCL, and formerly director of research and development at the National Health Services Executive Nantes. He's also worked internationally, including the Parliament of Micah in the USA. He was knighted for his services to medicine in 2005. He's been the chair of the UK Medical Research Council, Global Health Group, and a member of the MRC Strategy Board. He is formerly chair of the University's UK Health and Social Care Policy Committee and a member of the WHO Advisory Committee on Health Research. He is a trustee of the UK Biobank, the Medical Research Foundation, and of the Royal Society of Medicine. He also is on many other national and international committees. His research interests are in epidemiology and health services research. He's published many articles in primary health care research and global health issues, but particularly in climate change and health. In recent years, his research focus has been on the ethics of environmental health, environmental change on health, and the impact of policies to adapt or to mitigate these changes. He was a member of the Working Group 2 of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the second and third assessment reports and review editor of the health chapter at the fifth assessment report. He's chaired scientific, scientific advisory panel for the 2013 WHO World Health Report on Research for Universal Health Coverage. And in 2014-15, he chaired the Rockefeller Foundation, Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, and co-chaired the Development Group for Health Knowledge Action for Future Earth. He's led a number of Lancet series, including chair of the Task Force on Climate Change Mitigation and Public Health which is supported by consumption of uh, funding bodies led by the Vietnam Trust and uh, provides estimates of public health impacts on climate change mitigation strategies in the electricity generation, household, energy, transport, food, and budget sectors, which were published in 2009. Yeah, no. um, yeah. Professor Andy Haynes yeah. was linked to one of our professors when he was the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Professor Prakash Shetty, who was a professor of physiology, late of Professor Prakash Shetty was a professor of physiology, was a professor of nutrition at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he has fondly spoken of Sir Andy Haynes very often to my colleagues and mentors here at St. John's. So, Professor Haynes, we welcome you to St. John's. A warm welcome. It's an honor and privilege to have you here today. And well, thank you very much. Kind uh, introduction, and uh, it's a great honour for me to be here today. Great privilege, and of course, uh, Rakesh Shetty was one of those people that you meet in life that you you never forget. Who you have a warm feeling about, and uh, he made a great contribution. A wonderful colleague, I still sorely miss. So, what I'm going to talk about uh, today really is um, some of the challenges that are facing humanity, and I'm going to start really by referring to. Laudato Si, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, the formal title is On Care for Our Common Home. Um, and I thought this quotation was particularly apt to what I'm going to say today. So, as you can see, it says that I urgently appeal then for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation that includes everyone, since the environment challenge we're all undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. And it so happened that our last scene was published in 2015, when the report of a commission which I had the honor to chair also came out, this Commission on Planetary Health. So this was a commission funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, 
and published in the Lancet. So if you're interested to find out more, you can just download it. It's all um, open access. So what we were asked to do was to look at the interrelationships between environmental change and human health, to discuss how humanity might adapt to some of those changes, but also how we could live it with a much lower environmental footprint, but also sustain and promote uh, human health. The concept of planetary health is at heart quite a simple one. So what we said was that the health of human civilization ultimately depends on the state of the natural systems because of the interrelationship between these natural systems and human um, civilization that we often don't pay enough attention to. And certainly in conventional medical and even public health education, there's very little emphasis on this interrelationship. So we try to pull up some of that knowledge gap. It's so in quite a short period, it's not more that can be done. And our intention was to stimulate, really, more debate and more uh, research. I want to then move on to this slide, which I think is quite a dramatic slide. It's entitled The Great Acceleration. And what it shows you um, on the uh, left is the um, socioeconomic trends. So we've seen dramatic progress, human progress. We've seen absolute poverty decline. We've seen a dramatic increase in gross domestic product and economic growth. You can see world population is now 7.5 billion people, it may be 10 billion people by the end of the century, we don't know. In order to sustain that growing world population with its growing demands for energy and for resources, we've seen a dramatic increase in the way in which we use water. So we're now using about 4,000 cubic kilometers of fresh water in order to provide fresh water for, to grow the food, for example, or to cool the power stations or whatever it is. And dramatic increases also in fertilizer consumption. So there has been tremendous progress, no question about that. We've seen um, on a global scale life expectancy increase by a quarter of a century since the middle of the last century. But all this, of course, has come at cost. And the cost has been borne largely, of course, by the Earth systems. And the Earth systems trends are shown on the other side of this slide. And you can see that there's been an increase in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the most powerful greenhouse gas. It stays up in the atmosphere, 20% of it, for about 1,000 years or so. So it's a legacy that we're leaving future generations. And I think that was part of the motivation, really, behind Laudato Si, pointing out the humanity. We ourselves are now leaving behind residual major problems for current and future uh, generations. So we need to understand the extent of these environmental changes, how they can affect our health now, and also how they will affect the health of future generations. This is a complex issue. We're not talking here about single effects, we're talking about systems, how we're changing complex systems with often unintended consequences. One of the consequences might be that we burst out of the finite planetary boundaries within which we've developed as a species and move into uncharted territory. So this concept of planetary boundaries has been advanced by a number of scientists, by, by Stefan um, and colleagues. Um, and what they said was that uh, we're now living in this new geological epoch. It's been called the Anthropocene epoch because it's dominated by the activities of our species, one species we become totally dominant on the whole planet. Scientists debate when that epoch started. I like to say about 1950, around the middle of the last century. Some people said earlier because they were already perceptive for changes even earlier than that. But this slide shows you, illustrates some of these boundaries, the nine planetary boundaries that this group uh, proposed. You can see that for some of them, like climate change, we're now kind of yellow, so we're amber. So we're getting close, probably, to the edge of the tolerable limits. We're injecting all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But others, like the integrity of the biosphere, we've already pushed it way beyond what's happened in pre-human times into this red zone. So we're losing species at a hundredfold greater rate than pre-humanity, at least a hundredfold, maybe even higher. And then we're overloading many water systems with nitrogen and phosphorus in this attempt to grow more food. Uh, some of it's wasted because a lot of it's used excessively and so on. And then we're exploiting land. So we've now 
essentially exploited the maximum amount of uh, ice-free land. We, there's not much more that we can exploit to grow uh, more food. So we're reaching the limits there as well. I won't go into all of these, these boundaries. There's only one that I probably disagree with a little bit, and that's what they call novel entities, which is these novel chemical compounds, sometimes nanotechnologies, that we're beginning to inject into the environment. So we have about 80,000 chemicals, many of them produced in the lab in recent five or six decades. About 3,000 of them are high volume of those, but only about half of them we have adequate toxicity testing. So that's what they call when they're talking about novel entities. The problem there is there won't be a single boundary. It's exceptionally complex. It's about the interaction between these different entities. But the others, I think, uh, you know, are pretty compelling, um, uh, pretty compelling uh, science behind them. So uh, let me then give you two potential futures based on future climate. So the top line is what happens if we just carry on burning fossil fuels as we are at the moment. So most of the greenhouse gases are related to either burning of fossil fuels or the exploitation of land, agriculture, and so on. Um, and the bottom blue line is what would happen if we could cut back on greenhouse gas emissions quite radically and in short order over the coming decades. And that means we might have to keep it below two degrees warming. Remember, we've already warmed the planet by one degree in industrial times. Doesn't sound very much, but that's a planetary uh, mean, it's an average. The land is warming faster than the oceans. And when you look at the map of the temperature, it's not uniform across the planet. For example, the Arctic is warming much faster than other parts of the world. And that's causing the Arctic ice caps and so on. So where are we now? Are we going to be closer to that red line or the blue line? Well, the truth of the matter is at the moment we're somewhere between the two. So if we implement what was agreed in Paris, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, then we're about 3 degrees, 3.2 degrees, something of that order by the end of the century. So, you know, there's some progress, but we don't know whether the Paris Agreement will be honored or not. Um, so we have everything um, to play for. And as you move towards higher temperatures, scientists uh, believe that there are higher risks. And this slide just shows you some of the increasing risks. And you can see the color change as we move towards very high risk. You can see that as we move beyond 1.5 degrees warming, many ecosystems are threatened because species can't move rapidly enough as the temperature changes. Some can, some can't. Coastal flooding, as you warm the oceans, of course, they expand, water expands, so they get more coastal flooding. Extreme weather events, look at the news today, there are extreme storms expected in Australia and uh, in other parts of the world. Just seen a massive tornado, mm. a massive cyclone in Mozambique. Now, we can't say that one event is necessarily caused by climate change, that increases the probability that these very extreme events are likely to occur. The coral reefs are dying off. The Arctic is melting. Um, and we're seeing, we're beginning to see declines in crop yields, which will get more extreme, particularly in tropical and subtropical regions. And we're also seeing more heat exposure. So as you warm the temperature, it becomes more difficult to work outside. If you're a subsistence farmer, it's more difficult to work in the summer months. And that will push more people into poverty. And if you're a subsistence farmer, if you lose one month's income, that's devastating because you don't have any resources to fall back. So many, many changes, and as we warm, as we go into unexplored territory with climate and other environmental risks, we magnify um, those risks. So what might be the implications of climate change on human health? I'm not going into great detail. There are conferences on this debating um, how much human health is going to be affected and what the impacts might be. This slide summarizes what is a very complex and evolving literature. What you can see is that the center is the climate, changing climate. Then it moves out to affecting different environmental variables. And on the outer circle, you can see the health effects that could be influenced by this changing climate. So we see the infectious diseases. Dengue is probably the uh, you know, biggest um, communicable disease problem that we have, vector borne disease problem that affects nearly 400 million people a year. We think it's beginning to be affected by climate. Climate's not the only factor, but there's already always multiple factors, but climate is one factor. We see um, severe weather, as I mentioned, heat related illness, a decline in labor productivity. 
respiratory allergies, as you put more CO2 into the atmosphere, that stimulates the growth of plants, including allergenic plants. Impacts on water quality, diseases like cholera, leptospirosis after floods, and so on, can be affected. And of course, undernutrition, diarrheal disease. And then finally, there's very indirect effects, which are most difficult to quantify. Things like forced migration, civil conflict, and some of the effects on mental health. So how does this relate to cities? Now, I'm going to try and look at this through two different lenses, through the lens of urban living and also the lens of the food system, which is so vital to sustain the health of humanity. Well, why are cities important? Well, because urbanization, we are largely urban creatures now. More than 50% of the population is urban. That's where all the population growth is occurring. This slide shows you how urbanization has progressed over the past 500 years. You can see um, India is still at a relatively early stage of urbanization, about a third, it's probably gone up even since the slide was made, but it's still below that of, say, Japan, which is over 90%. So we are increasingly urban creatures, cities are expanding, they're often ill-adapted to the Anthropocene epoch, and we need to think about different ways of urban living in the Anthropocene. And this is both a threat and an opportunity here in India, because you have an opportunity to redesign some of these growing cities in more environmentally sustainable ways. We also know that some of these factors are amplified by living in cities. So when you live in a city, you get something called the urban heat island. You can experience it if you drive in the country to the city. You can feel the temperature difference on a few degrees. Even within the city, there's quite a lot of diversity. If you're near a green space, near a park, that's often cooler than if you're actually in the intense part of the city. So you get the urban heat island magnifying the challenge. And the slide also shows, difficult to see, I think, on the slide, but it shows you the difference between the high emission scenario and the low emission scenario. So the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the top side is mid-century. So you can see that um, the, the triangles are, and the dots are, are fairly close together by mid-century. But by 2100, with these two different emission scenarios, we see two radically different futures. So you can see that some cities, by the end of the century, if you carry on with the, mid, uh, the, the high emission scenario, you could have warming of six or seven degrees. That's not a trivial amount, it's a lot of warming. If we can cut back emissions and keep below two degrees average, then we can also keep the temperature increase in many of those cities below two or three degrees, perhaps, something of that order. So remember, high emission scenario could be six or seven degrees warming in some cities. That's compared to today. And it might be amplified by the other side. We know already that heat in cities has all sorts of effects. In Ahmedabad, for example, in 2010, there was a big heat wave, caused very large numbers of deaths. You can see the spike in deaths that occurred in uh, mid to late May. Deaths got very quickly, particularly in the elderly, often in unair conditioned accommodation but also sometimes in children as well as a result of immunocompromised diseases. So as you get these extreme and long-lasting heat waves, the death rates are likely to go up more. Air conditioning can help to some extent, but with air conditioning, first of all, you need a reliable grid. Secondly, it increases fossil fuel use. And thirdly, where does the, air, where does the heat go? It goes outdoors. So you know, you're increasing the heat time of the city. <laughs> So there's another uh, side to this as well, that climate change is linked to some of the problems we're having right now with our health today. I was talking with Tony on my way in about some of the issues that are affecting Bangalore now, air pollution. Well, is there a link between climate change and air pollution? Yes, there is a number of links. Climate change will affect air pollution, but it's also driven by many of the sources that are also um, responsible for air pollution. Pollution. So much of the ambient air pollution is related to the burning of fossil fuels. Some of this dust as well, as we experience uh, locally. But it's related, much of it, to the way in which we're living in the Anthropocene. So that's a threat to our health right now. It's also an opportunity. Because if we could move towards a cleaner, low carbon economy, then we could improve health now, as well as reducing climate change. Air pollution, ambient air pollution kills about 4 million a year. Uh, household air pollution kills about uh, three, something of that order. It's a very common cause of lower respiratory infections, household air pollution, as you know. Also, ambient and household air pollution are a big contributor to non communicable diseases. So when I was taught about NCDs, I was taught about smoking, uh, blood pressure, uh, BTs, obesity, all very important. 
that they have ever mentioned to me the evolution. And now we realize it's a big specific fact. So I never, I never discussed evolution with any patient, which I'm very excited about when I look back at the day, but you know, it's important to raise these kind of issues with me. So here's um, evolution in cities um, in relation to income. So you can see the high income cities tend to be lower air pollution, but it's not invariable. Some like Doha have very high levels of air pollution, probably dust related. You can see Delhi on the side, up on the top um, to uh, your left. Beautiful. Delhi's right at the top there. So that's um, over 120, uh, 120 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, of course, Delhi gets a lot, lot bigger than that, but it, uh, that's kind of broad average. Some people say it's even higher. Uh, but some cities, even at quite low incomes, have quite low levels of air pollution. So um, there are ways of getting around this. In India, we've seen a great paper from uh, Kanta Balakrishnan and colleagues. Uh, so the access to work is downloaded from the internet. This is the impact of air pollution on deaths in India, in the states of India. Uh, what you can see is there's a red band across the north of India. We get extremely high levels of uh, ambient air pollution. And then you get on the on B, uh, the B is a household proportion using solid fuels. Tamil Nadu and uh, the south, Karnataka, uh, is a bit lower than some parts of India, but it's still pretty high, as you know. And the ambient air pollution, again, a bit lower than north of India, but still really quite high. Um, it's probably you know, between 40 and 60, something of that order, I would guess. And I, I gather some of your local monitoring suggestions about over 50 on the campus here. So that's pretty high exposure, in fact. So it's a major problem. And what her group also showed was that air pollution is a bigger killer at the moment in India than tobacco. So it just emphasizes the fact it's a major cause of the diseases. Um, this slide shows you some of the very recent data on the relationship between air pollution and the mm -hmm. uh, non-communicable diseases. So the PM levels on the horizontal axis and the hazard ratio on the vertical axis different uh, types of outcomes. So you can see that um, as it goes up, uh, as the air pollution goes up, you get increased risk of uh, respiratory infection, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, heart disease. Um, and um, you can also see that even at quite low levels of air pollution, you can still get increased risk. So where I come from, you know, we have an air pollution level of perhaps 15. So you might think, well, that's quite low. But there's actually a lot of public concern about air pollution because we're also understanding uh, the effects of it. So we know that even at these low levels, it has very important effects. And the slide uh, the, on the left side uh, showed the PM level in Delhi on the lolly road as we were walking past. We saw this evolution monitor with the, with the levels, and it was very interesting. So I saw PM 2.5, 66, I think that's, well, that's quite bad. And then I saw next to it, green, excellent. <laughs> so it all depends on your risk perception. You know, in Delhi, I can understand people don't want to cause public alarm. In London, that would be great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why policymakers minimize the effects of air pollution. It's not an easy, easy issue to deal with. But our role in health, in public health, is to say, no, it's not, it's not green, it's red. And we need to do something about it. So that's air pollution. So there's a lot we can do by cleaning up the air um, with our health right now. Um, uh, and that will also help to um, reduce climate change, we move towards clean energy. But we also need to adapt to the changes that we can't prevent. So this is just how um, we're seeing record-breaking rainfall in some cities. This is the um, Hurricane Harvey, for example, um, in the West Gulf in, in, in Texas. Record-breaking uh, flooding in that uh, region. And we know as you warm the atmosphere, you know. it carries more water. So what that means is that when you have storms, you get more Dance, water deposited medical college. and more, more flooding. That has important Dance, um, health college. implications. We also know that the sea level, as I mentioned, is going oh, to rise by the 2080s, and about 13% of the world's population lives in close proximity to the coast. We know that there are many impacts of floods, health impacts of floods. You may have seen them yourself here. Mm. You get increased in leptospirosis, cholera, diarrheal diseases, various medical diseases, as well as the long term effects. So, if you follow people up on flooding, you find out about a year, many of them have high levels of mental ill health, <coughs> depression, and anxiety. That's probably because of destruction of their personal goods, increase in poverty, 
um, and the damage to their houses and so on. But it's something we find in high and low income countries. We also know that many countries are affected by the opposite of high rainfall, which is drought and water stress. That will be magnified by climate change. But we also know that much of the water that we depend on was laid down over millennia. So if you start to pump it out, you can't just replace it overnight. And India, of course, has a particular problem. You can see on this map, India is one of those red countries that is depleting its water resources at an unsustainable rate. So the problems with fresh water will be magnified by climate change. So let me move on to a slightly more positive message. What could cities do in country health? Well, there's a great deal they can do. They can have accessible and efficient public transport, active travel, universal access to low carbon energy, access to green spaces, housing improvements and improved water and sanitation. Mm -hmm. We believe that the future of planetary health will very much depend on cities because they are responsible for about three quarters of the global energy related greenhouse gas emissions because that's where all the economic growth takes place. And this slide shows you a tale of two different cities. One of them is Atlanta, Georgia, the US, and the other is Barcelona, Spain. So they both house about five million people. So that's less than half the population we have here. But there are dramatic differences between them. Look at the spatial difference. So Atlanta covers 7,500 square kilometers to, to house 5 million people. Its transport carbon-related emissions are about seven tons a year. Barcelona, same population, less than 700 square kilometers. Transport emissions are about one. So why is the difference? Well, it's fairly obvious, really. If you live in Atlanta, you have to use your private car. You have to drive everywhere. So that pumps out massive amounts of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, and also, of course, it's responsible for sedentarism. So you can't drive your car and get anywhere. And um, the slide also, at the bottom, that picture shows you the relationship between urban density and the, um, transport, the energy use in private transport. So the more sprawling the city is, the more you have to use private transport in order to get around, unless you have people with the foresight to develop metro systems and public transport systems and so on. So this is not written in stone. We can change it, but that's the way it is right now. So we need to think how to address these sprawling cities. And I think the last time I came to Bangalore, I had a much, much lower population than it has now. It's become very sprawling. So the question is, how do your local policymakers and how do you, as health professionals, advise them about how to develop this sprawling um, city? And of course, India has some of the highest mm -hmm. population densities by city, so that suggests it could be quite efficient cities. Uh, Mumbai and Delhi and Chennai are up there with, with the best, if you like, or the most dense cities. So there is that potential to create very efficient cities. So there are three broad challenges in developing sustainable and healthy cities. One is to increase the resilience to environmental change. The second is to reduce the environmental footprint so that we can live healthy lives with much lower environmental impact. And the third is to promote and protect health, which are intrinsically related. First of all, about resilience. So let me take the example of Amdabad. So Amdabad has a lot of heat stress. So what they've been doing is to develop early warning systems. There's a lot of interest now in early warning systems for heat, in some countries for food, for famine, and also infectious diseases like dengue and malaria, which is strongly climate related. So in Andalusia, they developed a heat early warning system. I won't go into detail, but essentially what they do is they look at the threshold which heat related deaths are likely to increase. They issue a warning where the meteorologists predict that threshold will be increased. The health system then reacts. They try to contact the vulnerable population to bring them into cooling facilities, to give them advice about better hydration, to make sure the hospitals are on alert for increasing emissions, uh, emissions from um, heat related stress, and to provide much better public advice about what to do in relation to heat stress. And the bottom part of the slide, maybe you can see, but it compares the death rate with the heat wave in 2018 and the subsequent. I think 2016. And what they found was quite a big difference between. So it does seem that this heat wave early warning system is having an effect. The question is, how long can it go on? When you get to warning, when you get 50 degree temperatures, 52, 53, will these heat waves be enough? We don't know. 
but you know, we have to do what we can. We also know that ecosystems can play a very important role in helping to sustain and um, reduce the risks in urban environments. So many cities, for example, um, they depend on their fresh water supply from uh, watersheds, so intact ecosystems. <clears throat> About 30% of the world's largest cities depend on the clean water from protected areas. So we need to ensure that those, those areas are continued to be protected. Many people are interested in natural, uh, nature-based solutions. So in other words, um, think about how nature can help you sustain or prevent flooding or extreme events. So people are talking about wetlands, preserving wetlands which can absorb lots of water and prevent coastal and other types of flooding. Um, the, the Chinese are developing the concept of sponge cities. So they see the city like a sponge which absorbs intense rainfall. This is a picture of one of them. You can see that they actually deliberately leave these green spaces which are capable of absorbing torrential rain um, without uh, and reduce the levels of flooding. So this is kind of an innovative solution, nature-based solution to uh, flooding in, in cities. And then the benefits of moving towards um, a low carbon economy. So if we can decarbonize, what's called decarbonizing the energy supply of cities, we can also um, improve air quality and reduce climate change. And this is a paper that's coming out actually on Monday in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by myself and a number of colleagues leading that, working with a whole range of uh, modelers, looking at the effects of a, a, a sort of experiment, if you like, of decarbonizing the world economy. What would happen? if we could take fossil fuels out of the world economy. So it's a kind of, if you like, a utopian experiment. It gives you an idea of what we could achieve. And what we found was that we could prevent about 3.6 million deaths a year just from ambient air pollution. That's just not, not household, that's just the ambient air pollution. And even more, the bottom part of the slide, if we could reduce some of the other source of emissions like the ones from agriculture or household energy. So we can do that by moving towards renewables, so the plants, so the energy, wind energy, wave other uh, clean um, renewable sources. So there's a big health dividend from decarbonizing uh, the economy. We also know there's a big health dividend from moving towards more sustainable transport systems. All of us have a problem not getting enough exercise. You know, it's unlike you, you buy your gym membership, but do you really go every day? I don't think so. I don't, anyway. Uh, the only exercise I get really pretty well is on my, on my bicycle when I go to work. So, Otherwise, I would be pretty well sedentary. Um, so we did some work some years ago in Delhi where we modeled the effect of a different kind of transport system. More, this is before the metro came in a big way, I think. So we looked at the low carbon transport system, more public transport, cleaner cars where they were used, more walking and cycling with more separated cycling days, so safer cycling and so on. We found big health benefits from that. I don't know if we get the same answer if we looked at it today. We might have different numbers because the transport systems evolved uh, you know, quite a lot. It'd be interesting to rewrite. It'd be interesting to do it for Bangalore, actually, to do some of the modeling, to see what would happen if you change the transport system here. Um, you, know, you, you can use the kind of coefficients we know about linking physical activity to uh, various cardiovascular diseases and also air pollution exposure and so on. So it can be done. It would be very interesting exercise to do. And you see all these potential benefits here. We know that, of course, cycling is, it can be a dangerous activity. Um, and the, one of the ways to reduce the danger is to separate the cyclists from the motorized traffic. And the other is the sheer numbers. So if you're a lone cyclist, you're really one. You know, you're really threatened. And, uh, but if there are many cyclists, then you have low danger and relatively um, fewer casualties. So it's partly a kind of mass effect. Once you get the majority of people cycling, then it becomes safer. And of course, if you're in a very hot city, then you may want to think about electric bikes. They, they can allow you to move around quite, quite quickly, um, still give you some physical activity, but be more usable. We know also that people's uh, transport uh, activities are related to obesity. And this is a study that we, my colleagues at London School did using the UK Biobank, which is a, a volunteer sample. Half a million people voluntarily participated. They give their bodies the blood samples on a range of samples. They undergo a range of physiological tests and so on, and even imaging in some of them. And what they found in a subsample of this population was that those people who use their car only, or car plus public transport, um, that's the kind of reference level of obesity, 
as they looked at the people who had increasingly used public transport and active travel, then the body fat declined. There was no dose response um, effect. So you can see that the people who cycled, cycled and walked to work had much lower levels of body fat. So that's a kind of empirical just example of how um, the way that you get to work affects your, your, your health. Um, and this slide is about uh, diabetes and shows about neighborhood walkability. It's taken from a big study in, in Canada. And the, and the bottom line, that orange line, is the most walkable neighborhood. So they divide it into five quintiles of walkability, large population. They found the less walkable neighborhoods had higher levels of diabetes. The more walkable neighborhoods, much lower levels and declining um, levels of, of diabetes. So if you can provide the services that people need within walking distance, then they will use them. So one answer for a city like Bangalore might be to have a multifocal, um, multifocal development, so you provide the essential services close to where people live rather than drawing them all in to use the same shopping centre or whatever it is, the same market. So that's a lot of interest now in using the urban environment to prevent uh, diabetes. We're also seeing um, apps, downloadable apps, that will tell you where it's safer to walk, both in terms of physical safety but also air pollution exposure. Because increasingly you can build up air pollution micro maps of cities, which will tell you where they have high levels of air pollution are. I mean, we're all breathing in air pollution at the moment, the fine particles drift all over the place, but there, there is some concentration closer to big roads, and also nitrogen oxide, which we believe is also important as much is clustered close to the large roads. So this is just an example of a well-being walk in London, which tells you how to get from um, Euston uh, to King's Cross and go through the back streets. You just download the app and uh, follow, follow, follow that. We see a lot of sustainable mobility trends scaling up, so lots of car-free zones are happening in cities, but bus rapid transit systems, bike sharing schemes, low emission zones. We, we expect all of those to have a beneficial health effect, but we need to kind of evaluate um, many of them. It'd be very interesting to evaluate them in the context of India. We also know there's a lot of interesting green space at the moment, um, because we know that green space confers a lot of health benefits, so it's become increasingly evident that it is. So this is about mental health. So the vertical line here is no effect, so it's a meta-analysis. And you can see that displeasurable moods um, are decreased by exposure to green space, and um, pleasurable moods are increased by exposure to green space. Seems to be a very robust kind of finding. Uh, they depend on the quality of the green space to some extent. There's also growing evidence about green, greenness and cardiovascular disease. So this is a big study of 2.3 million adults in, in Canada by Mike Brower and others, again published quite recently, Open Access in Lancet Planetary Health. And the top line shows you the dose response rate. So you get decreased death rates from CBD and respiratory deaths as you have more exposure to greenness in proximity um, to where you live. So it seems, again, to be a robust finding. We don't fully understand the mechanism. Is it reduced air pollution, increased physical activity? We don't, we don't exactly know right now. And then there's birth outcomes as well. Another interesting, also from Mike Brower's group um, in British Columbia, um, and they've shown that uh, proximity to residential greenness uh, improves birth outcomes. And it doesn't seem to be just related to air pollution and noise and so on. So there's something else going on. We don't quite understand what it is. A lot more work is needed. We're also aware that uh, where you live, how you live in your house has a big effect on your health. So there's a whole lot of projects going on. This is just one example of a project in Delhi, which is aiming to kind of optimize, so called Opti House. So it's able to build housing which is optimal for your health. So it aims to tackle dampness and mold, both heat and cold exposure by better insulation, ventilation, mosquito ingress to prevent vector-borne diseases, reduce indoor air pollution by cleaner sources of energy, and reduce ingress of pests. So it's an attempt to do a holistic solution to housing for low-income communities, and there's increasing interest in that kind of housing development. And we see a number of mayors um, developing a vision of um, a low carbon, um, uh, clean, green city. This is just the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. This is uh, his and his colleagues' vision. By 2050, they want to have half of London area will be green. So planting lots of trees, for example. The tree canopy, canopy will increase by 2050. They say they want to have the best air quality of any major world city. 
It's very convenient. He's uh, going to do that well after he would have left office. It's always very convenient for a mayor to have a wonderful vision, but a vision that needs to be achieved after they leave office. It's a wonderful thing to do. I commend them for it, but I wish they would try to achieve that vision uh, more quickly. So he wants also to be zero waste, climate resilient, and carbon neutral. So I don't know if the mayor's in Bangalore and has the same aspirations, but if they do, ask them to bring forward the time scale a little bit. So let me conclude by saying something about the food system. Um, and I'm going to just briefly, because I'll ask to speak about this, I haven't got much time, I want to just quickly go through it. The reason I want to talk about it is because people often don't think about the food system in terms of the environment, but it has very big implications for the environment. It's a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, about 30%, something of that order, through complex various pathways, which I won't go into in detail, including ruminants, land use change, so ruminants produce methane as a powerful greenhouse gas, rice paddies produce methane as well, a lot of other um, causes. Water, we know it's a major driver of water depletion, so you're depleting the aquifers here in India in order to grow more food. And you're pumping the aquifers you know, very, the levels going down all the time. And it's only so long you, you, you can do that. So it's a major contributor to global water withdrawal. Soil degradation. In many parts of the world, soils are degrading. Again, you can't replace them. Something perhaps up to 12 million hectares a year lost, blows away. Um, and we need to work out how to sustain the soils that we have. Uh, and then finally, it's a major driver of biodiversity. So as, as we transform the land to grow food, we destroy biodiversity. You know, these big fields, these big farms, they pull out the hedges, they become monocultures, uh, the bees, the, you know, the pollinators can't survive as well. So uh, it's a major uh, destroyer of biodiversity. We need to develop different types of agriculture which sustain biodiversity. Our food system is depending on a very narrow range of crops. So if we look at the globally identified plant species, it's a quarter of a million, probably more. 7,000 crops have been used by humans throughout history. But now we're depending on 12 crops and five animal species to depend seven, to, put, to provide three quarters of our energy intake. So that makes us vulnerable because you can address dietary energy supply, but you can't address micronutrient efficiency with such a narrow diet. You need to have broad, you know, you need to access to a wide range of foods, including fruit and vegetables, of course, to address that. So we are really going on a dangerous course with agriculture. We're destroying the environment, very narrow um, range of crops that we're dependent on. If we get some major pest affecting one of those crops, then that could have a big effect. And we know that um, climate change is going to have a big effect on crop yield in, in countries like India, shown in the red on this map, uh, mid-century, probably big declines in crop yield. And that overlaps with the current global hunger index. And indeed, we're seeing the number of people hungry or undernourished people going up. It's gone down for many years. The last couple of years it's started to go up. Is that climate change? We're not sure. Um, these are the challenges to future food supply in India. Uh, population growth, dietary change, groundwater depletion, climate change. And the, the red areas show you where in India the groundwater is being depleted the most. And you can see it's northwest and also parts of the south here as well. And the bottom here, we compare Indian and European diets in terms of their impacts on the environment. And you may not be able to see it very clearly, but the orange or the sort of uh, orangey red column is um, the greenhouse gas emissions. So the European diets have higher emissions because they eat more animal products, Indian diets lower. The European diets have higher green water, which is the rainfall, but the Indian diets have higher blue water. Blue water is the groundwater. So you're exploiting your groundwater in order to grow the foods, and that's not uh, sustainable. So overall, the dietary patterns, and they're quite diverse around India, of course, overall they're more sustainable from a climate point of view in terms of emissions, but the problem is the fresh water that use. We're also seeing that the nutritional quality of crops is changing, so as you put more carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere, it stimulates crop growth to some extent, but the problem is also reduces the nutritional quality. And this slide shows you how it's reducing, it's going to reduce the zinc and iron concentration. So it's going to increase the problems of micronutrient deficiency. And you can see that India is a high-risk country uh, for that. 
So what about more sustainable uh, dietary patterns? This is a systematic review we did a couple of years back. It was mainly based on Western diets, because that's where, the, well, that's where the evidence was. But you can see vegetarian diets, big reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, big reduction in land use, and big reduction in, in water use compared with our more meat-based diets. So increasing the intake of plant, uh, food, plant-based uh, diets seems to be the way to go. And a number of other studies have shown that. This study just came out in the Lancet a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen it, the Eat Lancet Commission. And they tried to look forward at the kind of diet, if you like a kind of global diet, that could be interpreted in different, adapted to different cultures. And they suggested that we all needed to be eating a lot less red meat, which is that red uh, segment there. And um, uh, so that red segment there. Uh, that red meat essentially ought to be a kind of luxury, the one occasionally. Uh, that need, everyone needs to eat more um, fruit and vegetables, so we all probably have to consume. We need to eat 200 grams of fruit, 300 of vegetables, doing lots of dark green vegetables every day, and more whole grains, less refined, refined grains. So they said if we could do that, that would reduce the um, environmental impact of the food system, but also prevent a lot of deaths, and they suggested there could be many millions of deaths. And here in India, I've just done some work with the National Institute of Nutrition showing that if we could shift the Indian population to healthy guidelines, particularly with increases in fruit and vegetables, that would uh, increase environmental footprints very, very little indeed, and have very little effect on environmental footprints. Uh, and it would also improve health in a big way. But on the other hand, if the affluent diets, if, the top, if everyone eats like the top 20% of the population here, then that would increase environmental indicators really quite uh, dramatically, both greenhouse gas emissions and water use. So what we need to do is to focus on promoting healthy diets, particularly increased fruit and vegetable consumption, which is just not affordable for a lot of poor people. So I don't have time to go into the solutions, but they're essentially agricultural and behavioral. So there are technological solutions like GM crops, a bit controversial, but I think there is a role for them. There's the veggie burgers, which are, you know, many, you've got the Impossible Burger, for example, which has been marketed in many countries as a vegan burger, become increasingly popular. Some people are going to get insects. Many cultures eat insects. They're very low environmental impact. They're very high in protein. No zoonotic diseases from eating insects. So a lot of interest in, in insects. Um, a lot of interest in, um, in crops which have increased micronutrient levels, for example. We have people growing crops indoors. There are people growing um, crops in shipping containers in Lagos. There's a thriving industry of run by women of growing crops under LED lights in shipping containers. So they're extremely efficient lighting. Um, and they're growing lots of green salad vegetables, very healthy vegetables. So is there, are there new kinds of more sustainable economic development? And then there's micro drip irrigation. So lots of technologies, behavior change, and also some uh, using some, some kind of indigenous foods, indigenous knowledge, and so on. And some cities are also uh, looking at the way in which we can combine sustainable food systems with urban development. So lots of, I don't have time to go into them, but there are a whole host of cities that are mentioned here that are developing urban agriculture. They're regrowing, regreening uh, abandoned spaces. Um, they're trying to develop local agricultural markets. And they're trying to develop our strategies to reduce food waste and move towards uh, more sustainable solutions, even roof gardens, growing um, uh, crops on the roof. The health system, I think I might, because I'm running out of time, I think I might, I think I might leave that the health system. I'll come back to it perhaps in questions if you want to ask me questions about what the health system can do. I just want to finish really on this one quote, which is also from Alberto uh, C. So I think it's a very powerful quote. We urgently need a humanism capable of bringing together the different fields of knowledge including economics, in the service of a more integral and integrating vision. Today, the analysis of environmental problems cannot be separated from the analysis of human, family, work-related, and urban context, nor from how individuals relate to themselves, which leads in turn to how they relate to others and to the environment. So this is a really important takeaway message. And the message from the Commission was that solutions do lie within reach, and they should be based on the redefinition, the redefinition of prosperity to focus on the enhancement of the quality of life, the delivery of improved health for all, 
together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. So I'll leave you with those thoughts that we have for a few moments. I'm very happy to answer questions or come up and approach me afterwards. Thank you very much.
I mean, it's something you could do. I recommend you look at a paper by someone called Tainio, who, who uh, you, I think it's Open Access Paper 2014. They looked at the trade-offs in different, uh, against different levels of background air pollution for cycling and walking, the benefits of doing so versus the risks of increased air pollution. I think you'll find that if you cycle for more than an hour or two, given the current local air pollution levels, you may find the adverse effects for that way. But it depends where you cycle. If you cycle on some of the back streets, you avoid some of the worst pollution. It'd be interesting to put a pollution monitor on you and then see how much pollution you're actually getting. You, you now get these portable monitors. You could do a little experiment yourself and just see how much level, how much pollution exposure you're getting. I'm happy to go on with you for that. <laughs> interesting experiment to do. Well, congratulations on cycling anyway. Thank you. Yeah, my question is in continuation to, I'm Aruna, by the way, from the Molecular Medicine Inter right. Research Institute. Um, so, since there is this um, the disparity between the advantages of doing something like that and opting for renewable energy uh, solutions, but in India, um, for example, you said the ruminants, um, the methane pollution because of that, but there is no way that can be avoided especially in the non-urban rural areas. But do you think the contribution to world uh, pollution and climate change because of factors like this is more than, uh, for example, in developed countries where they burn electricity much more than we do? No, I mean, the developed countries are responsible for much more of the greenhouse gas emissions. There's no question about that. So the historical emissions from countries like the US and my own country, the UK, are obviously much greater per capita than in India. So that's certainly true. Um, but the problem is that, you know, you could say, well, we have every right to burn just as much as you have historically. And some people have said that. The problem is if everyone in the world does do that, then we're all in trouble. <laughs> so um, we, you know, we need to put pressure on countries like my own to decarbonize rapidly. We're trying to do that, but there needs to be more international pressure on to do so. But at the same time, um, we do need to make changes in emerging economies too. In terms of the contribution of ruminants, that's only, you know, it, it would make a contribution, but it's only a, a percentage contribution. There are also other methane sources like rice paddies, and there, it, with rice paddies, there are strategies to reduce the methane from rice paddies. So you can dry out the rice paddies, some farmers are drying out for seven days, which reduces the level of anaerobic bacteria and the production of methane. Actually, it apparently increases the yield as well. So, you know, there are technical solutions to some. Some people are also looking at dietary solutions for ruminants. So they're looking at the effect of different uh, diets on, on ruminants, so methane production. So it's quite an active area of research right now. There may be some technical solutions in the future. They're not available right now. Thank you, sir, for the talk about the Girish from the emergency department. There's a lot of buzz in the media about the Green New Deal in the U.S. Yeah. Is there any hope in something like that? Or is it just... Well, that's a really interesting question. So the Green New Deal, that many of you probably have heard about this, the Green New Deal is a proposal by the Democrats in the U.S. to create millions of jobs through a low carbon economy. And it's a very exciting proposal, maybe a bit idealistic, but it's a very exciting one. The sad thing about the U.S. is it's become politically very, very polarized. So if you're a Republican, you don't believe in climate change, whatever the science tells you, just don't believe in science. You think it's a conspiracy. Uh, I think the extreme politicization of science is a very, very dangerous thing. And the idea that because you're a Republican, you believe that, you're a Democrat, you believe this, is a big monster. You know, we need to tackle that. And we need to, uh, I think, try to promote a kind of more rational discourse. I think in the long term, it will count against the Republican Party. We're already seeing them losing the votes of young people because young people are turned off by the kind of negative policy. This uh, proposed by the Democrats is an exciting one, I think, the Green New Deal. So the idea is to create, just as the New Deal in the 1930s created all these jobs, the idea is to create new jobs through renewable energy. So there is quite a lot of evidence that you could create a lot of new jobs. It is an absolute priority for a country like India. You have to create a lot of new uh, jobs for uh, young people in the economy. Um, and that can be done, we know that renewable energy does require quite a lot of servicing, for example, installation. 
also has a lot of work in energy efficiency, insulation, for example, and even uh, in some of the active travel can create quite a lot of new jobs as well. There's been reports uh, on the bicycling industry, which I can create quite a lot of low, local jobs, which is really, really important. So I think myself, it's a very important initiative. I haven't looked into the detailed economics of it, but I think overall there is good evidence that we can create a lot of new jobs, socially useful jobs, which people find meaningful to do um, through a more sustainable uh, economy. So overall, I think it's a great initiative. I'm just sad that it's so visibly polarized. So thank you. Thank you. Interesting and actually good. 
the question I'm asking is the next question, which is, how do you think, or have you modeled, can land use in a fragmented land holding system support the production of food in India, for example, with that kind of a diet? And second, has anyone modeled this for the world? Well, I think that's a very important question. And um, I mean, obviously, we're not agriculturists, so we, we focus on the kind of nutrition. We do some of the environmental work. But essentially, this is a real challenge, because we need to work with colleagues in a whole range of different disciplines. And one of the areas that we're very keen to do is to strengthen the work we're doing with agricultural scientists. We have done some, but I think it would be a great opportunity here at St. John's, really, to forge close links with agricultural scientists to look at some of these solutions. So people are looking at different solutions. So agroforestry, for example, where you combine uh, a certain amount of forest cover uh, with uh, growth of crops is, is one approach that's being taken in parts of Africa and elsewhere. So there's also work trying to conserve, which is linked, I think, to the agroforestry. So conserving hedgerows, for example, which are often kind of refuges for pollinators and other species. So ensuring that the farmers don't take out all the divisions between between fields. More uh, conservation of water, of course, I mentioned briefly, kind of drip agriculture and some other uh, using drought resistant crops. So there are a whole range of agricultural strategies. One of the problems though is that the agricultural community and the nutrition community traditionally have not worked together. So the agriculturists are just focus on increasing yield. They don't even think about nutrition all the time. And so what we've been trying to do is to forge links with them to say let's work together so that when you come up with the strategy, we know that it's also going to be beneficial um, for, for nutrition. It's not just about producing lots of staple crops, you know, cheap carbohydrates. It's also about fruits and vegetables. And we know that fruit and vegetables are amongst the most vulnerable crops to environmental change. And they're so important, as you obviously know, uh, for nutritional purposes. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the future. We're beginning to see research funders getting interested in this area. And I think it's a great opportunity for you um, here to really pioneer some of the work that so desperately uh, needs to be done. So I hope that will happen. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Higgins. It's been wonderful to have you here. Uh, just on a note which you mentioned about agriculture and nutrition, uh, yeah, I'm happy to state that yes, Professor Kulpar himself is working closely with the University of Agricultural Sciences here for the last, uh, I think, decade or so or more, and uh, trying to solve these problems in a more global, uh, or in a more global way. Another uh, timely, uh, this talk has been very timely because St. John's as a health uh, care organization is now putting its little its feet into the area of air pollution. Uh, we are now talking to groups in, in, uh, who are interested to understand this problem in Bangalore. And just the day before yesterday, we have put our first known an air pollution monitor on the road just outside. You can Google it, there's something called Open Map. You can actually look at the PM2.5 levels. Uh, there is two sensors in India, in India right now, one at Calcutta and the US consulate and one in St. John's. And you'll soon see many more of these sensors in here. We're planning to put our foot in to try and understand air pollution with that, and it's a background camp. So thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. I was uh, a student and uh, a fellow at the London School when you were the dean. It's a pleasure to have you back here. Thank you so much, Mr. Wombo. It was close to lunchtime, but there's tea and coffee served outside and cookies. So please join us for a cup of tea and coffee, and if you would like to interact further with us, I can see what we do. Thank you.